Thank you so much for uh, joining us on the last day of the conference at nine, uh, 10 a.m. I, I really appreciate you all being here today. Uh, I'm David Troutman. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Higher Education at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And we're gonna spend the next hour just discussing credentials of value and what that means from a two-year, a four-year, and in the state of Texas. So to do some uh, background or context around credentials of value. Um, earlier last year, um, our commissioner um, released our strategic plan for the state of Texas for higher education. And part of that, uh, the, the, the heartbeat or the, the North Star associated with the strategic plan is to ensure that students are crossing the finish line with a credential of value, not just attainment with a degree, but making sure that students are receiving a positive return on their investment. When we look across the nation, we're really one of the first states to embed that into our strategic plan. And with that, our goal is by 2030 to produce 550,000 students with credentials of value each year. So that number keeps me up at night, 550,000 each year. And, in, in, and also making sure that when students leave with a, a credential that they have no or manageable debt. And what that means is really making sure that they can, um, that their, their debt to income ratio, so how much they're taking out, uh, is less than 10% of what they're making per month. And so I think the exciting thing about the strategic plan, one, another exciting thing about the strategic plan is it has an equity lens. When you look at the U.S. Census data from 2010 to 2020, Texas saw some of the largest population growth. 90% of that growth in Texas was from families of color. So in order to make sure that we hit the 550, we have to make sure that everyone has equitable opportunities in our state to thrive and succeed in higher education. And so today we're really going to take a deep dive into credentials to understand from the perspectives of two year, four year and from, from private companies. But before we do that, I want to give the opportunity to do some quick introductions. So we'll start with Garrett. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Garrett Groves. I am at Austin Community College where we serve 70,000 students in a year. Um, we have a lot of uh, programs and a lot of areas in which we do our uh, absolute best to help all the students that find us. Um, I'm the, in a dual role, I'm the Chief of Staff for the Chancellor, but I'm also our Vice Chancellor of Strategic Initiatives. And in that role, I lead a lot of our partnerships with industry, including Microsoft, Samsung, Tesla. And we think a lot about the credentials of value piece and how we message that to our students and families. Charisma? Good morning, everyone. Okay. I'm Dr. Charisma Edwards, and um, I am a technology strategist at a small company that you may know, you may have heard of, called Microsoft. Um, I am, what a technology strategist just means is that I work with uh, higher education institutions in South Texas on, um, on designing their, their strategic goals or, or helping them to meet their strategic goals undergirded by technology solutions. Um, I guess my con contribution here is partly my experience um, with higher education, academics um, in the past, but also um, where we can help, uh, where industry can help uh, the, the universities and the institutions meet their goals. Wonderful. Kimberly? Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Good morning, is that better? Hey, good morning, my name is Kimberly McLeod. I am the Associate Vice President of Economic and Academic Development for Texas A&M University Commerce. And in that role, I build relevancy for our uh, institution with the workforce, with municipalities, with corporations, um, with public school districts, with community colleges, um, to ensure that when our students do graduate, that they're able to enter into the workforce and that they have what David is talking about, this, this not only credential of value, but the hard and soft skills um, to be successful. Wonderful, so we're gonna jump right in. I, I believe in having sort of organic conversations, so I'm gonna 
um, do less of the talking and they're gonna do more of the talking, but I'm gonna um, just throw out a question and then um, we'll go through. But I think, I think the first question I have for each of you is why value now? You know, what do credentials of value mean to you? And, and why is it so important to have data and metrics about credentials of value and, and uh, of education, higher education after high school? So whoever wants to start first. <laughs> so I'll try to answer this pretty quickly. Um, for, uh, for me and for uh, companies, usually credentials of value just mean that you have a credential that we can that we can quickly see and use um, upon graduation. So once a student gets to us, they can uh, their time to productivity is quick. Um, that that's that's time is money, obviously. So when they are able to uh, get right in and be productive as soon as possible, that's very helpful for us as companies, and it's helpful for the students to um, excel in their careers. Um, the second question about data. Well, before we do that, okay. uh, I, I wanted to actually drill a little bit deeper. Okay. So based on our Dive. conversation earlier this morning, Dive. can you give me the example of how you're interacting with new graduates and what kind of questions you have to ask them yeah. when they're starting with you? <laughs> Absolutely. So I've had, uh, I've worked with some uh, collegiate students uh, in the past just as a I guess volunteer volunteer work um, outside of my day job, but with Microsoft, and um, some of them have been able to come over as interns or um, full time full time employees, and it's great. We're excited to have them, and I'll say, "Oh, hey, welcome to Microsoft. Now that you're here, grab some time on my calendar so that we can chat and so we can meet and and help you uh, set up a recurring meeting so we can I can help you just get um, acclimated and. Of course, they say yeah, and they don't. And I recognize; I can see immediately that they that there's something that they don't know, that they uh, think they're supposed to know, but they don't ask. So I lean in to ask them, "Do you know how to schedule a meeting on my calendar?" And most of the answer is no, um, because that's not something that they've done. They they usually aren't using um, Microsoft products, which is. Uh, what about, I think 90% of uh, corporate companies are using at this point, the Microsoft software. Um, and so I have to show them how to use Outlook, um, something that may be simple to us, or especially, I guess, my generation and, and before. Um, we typically know how to use Outlook very easily. They don't. So I have to show them how to schedule a meeting. And that's something that takes time these these are small things like uh, we talked about um, just having uh, uh, what do you call it soft skills and those those skills that nobody even thinks about that takes time for them to learn and they don't know what question they don't know what they don't know so they don't know the questions to ask to get acclimated to the environment quickly and then productive. Thank you. So Kimberly and Garrett. So you know, what do values and cred credential mean to you? I mean, I'm, I wonder first, are you telling me that there are credentials that don't have value? And if there are, then I think as a student, as a parent, I, I'd want to know that. I also think we need to point out that we're talking about wages and an economic return. A lot of what higher education does is more than that. We're training and educating the future of our country, of our world, citizenship, ethics, a lot of pieces that are important to the world. We're gonna set that aside, I think, for today because also a lot of our students, though, especially at a community college, are coming to us expressly for that value as we're defining it here. And it's way too hard to really understand what is my wages going to look like when I get done with whatever I've just enrolled in. Um, and so for value to me is it's easier for students and it's easier for families to understand. What am I putting into this set of courses, to this credential, to this degree, graduate or otherwise? And how hard is it going to be for me to translate that to the labor market and to family sustaining wages? Um, the other way I'd answer is it's actually kind of stunning from a student, family, and corporate view that we don't already have this figured out and ha haven't posted this information for a very long time. And in there gets maybe what we'll talk about in a bit. Like it's actually pretty difficult to do this well. Um, it's very, it was very difficult for those of us in the higher ed space to know that we had to push for a while on what does it mean to complete 
our education. What are graduation rates? How do you measure that? How do you, it's a complex thing we thankfully won't get into here. This is beyond completion though. We all go to higher education at various points in our lives for different reasons. And too many institutions don't have good information on which of our students are here for what reasons and which of our students get what they're looking for later. We've assumed higher education is just good. And I think that time and that door is closing and now credentials of value are trying to help us better communicate the answers. And I'll add to that in when I think of the word value by itself, um, it can have many definitions to many individuals um, by generation, by ethnicity, by geographics. Part of what I believe brings value to the conversation we're having, how do universities understand value? Uh, how do we interpret that? And how do we bridge what we understand as value with what students are coming to us um, from high school. And I'll say this, in K-12, students are, um, they have supports from counseling to uh, food pantries to um, advise, I mean, they have so many different supports that help them get to the place where they can graduate. When they transition to university, those supports aren't there anymore. And we're left with the interpretation that um, they don't know how, they weren't prepared correctly, almost like a deficit mindset. And I'm saying that to say, it's not that our students don't know how to survive. They don't know how to survive in higher education. They have a survival skill set. And so when we talk about value, how do we help create a bicultural understanding on how to survive in higher ed and in the workforce? So when you talk about credentials of value, you're talking about creating opportunities for engagement, accessibility, for students to understand the process of matriculation, of advising, of the supports, and helping them understand the skill set you had before, you may need a different skill set in order to not only um, finish the course, but enter into the workforce. So the credentials of value from an institutional perspective, how do we bridge where our students are coming from, make, re build relationships in the workforce to know where they are going to, and create a, a university experience where those students are able to successfully navigate higher ed and enter into the workforce with the hard and skill set, hard and soft skill set that they need, not just to survive, but to thrive in those environments. And maybe we need to reinvent and recreate and re-innovate because how the workforce is developing, it's shifting. And we have to have the agility to shift with it. Thank you for that. And I think that one thing we have to acknowledge is just the cost of living currently in the United States and in Texas. When you zoom out and you look at cost of attendance, and you look at how much tuition and fees are versus the just basic living skills, when you look at a four-year, tuition and fees accounts for around um, 30, I think 36% of the overall cost of attendance. And when you look at two years, it's around, I think, 22% of the overall cost of attendance. And that's due to rent increasing five to 30% within the state of Texas. That's looking at food costs, we've all experienced that. Um, last year was the largest increase in food costs since 1979 based off the FDA. So from a two year and four year perspective, you know, can you share your thoughts about the challenges and opportunities we, can, we, can, we face to ensure students are receiving those credentials of value? And, and one of our targets that we've changed is that we want 60% of our students who are traditionally aged students to receive a credential value, but we also want adult learners to come back and have at least 60% of those ages 35 to 64 to receive a credential as well. So from a two year and four year, can you sort of discuss sort of the challenges and opportunities you see with those types of metrics? So I'll say that, and you're right, thank you for bringing that up. I'm, I meant to add that when they're in public school, they're not 
they don't have those costs. When they come to higher ed, how do I afford to even stay? And so when you talk about the um, uh, metrics, um, when we're looking at can we afford to stay, and I'll say this, maybe two weeks ago I met with the city of Dallas, and we talked about opportunities, where you are, what are you doing, how are you expanding, and how the university can work with the city of Dallas to have bring those experiences to our students and strengthen our program. Part of our students being able to enter that workforce is having access to that workforce while they are still a student, to have the mentoring, the internships, the paid internships, for them to have, to have an understanding. It's almost like you have to begin with the end in mind they have to be able to see the end goal and so that they know how to prepare to receive that. And so part of our responsibility um, at a four year should be preparing them for the workforce and the workforce working with us to prepare them. And so one of the things we talked about with, with that municipality was um, they said, well, we need a different credential. This is what they're walking into, and the students are graduating, not prepared. Can we work with you to build a curriculum for this specific purpose? And that's where we need to be on the edge of innovation, preparing our students now for the workforce that they're going to enter into. And so with that, it, especially for um, underserved populations and first-generation populations, they need to have access um, in the workforce, they have to have those mentoring relationships and the support um, to get there. From a, I guess from a to your perspective, uh, what I'd add is as a country and as a culture, we're often not real honest with ourselves. Um, and one of those is on the credential value. You mentioned cost of attendance. Officially, the cost of attendance of attending Austin Community College is $18,000. Now, a year of tuition is only $2,500. We have a several bachelor's degrees at our college, and you can get those for $10,000 over four years. That's great. I don't know very many people who can rent a single bedroom apartment for $18,000 a year in Austin, yet alone pay for everything else and thrive in school while you're doing that. Um, so right away, cost of attendance is already building in an assumption that students are working, which is why over 80% of Austin students are work going to school part-time and working at least part-time. And we don't fully acknowledge that. The other way in which I think we're not often honest with ourselves, and you'll hear from Microsoft how a company's really thinking about what does it look like when we engage with mentorship and internship and build that into part of how you thrive at a company. Most companies that we still work with have not fully understood what it means to embrace this. It is way too hard to go to school and to work close to full time and then care for dependents, whether they're older or younger. Most of our students can't do that. When you go to school part time, instead of getting a two year associate's degree in maybe three years, you're now looking at four or five years to finish an associate degree. That is a long time to work part time and try to account for some of these things. And I'll, I'll stop now by just by saying a credential of value conversation is designed to try to lift up some of these realities. It's designed to show you what is it going to cost you while you're going through this education and what do you expect to make on the other end of that? And it opens up some difficult conversations where we have programs, even at Austin Community College, that maybe don't hit that threshold. And so we have to be real honest about then, well, how is that designed? How do you move through your career? How long are you spending under that threshold? They're difficult conversations we need to spend a lot more time talking about. And so Charisma, um, you'd mentioned in your earlier comment about time to productivity. How can we work with employers from the two year and four year side to make sure that we are helping you reduce that time to productivity and other types of metrics that you look at when you're trying to evaluate the performance of your employees? I think it's important for um, institutions to um, reach out and communicate closely with your um, with the companies, not just um, looking for, unfortunately, oftentimes we have uh, institutions coming to us looking for um, donations, like uh, uh, devices and the, all the wonderful things that we have to give, but also coming coming truly in a part as a partner, a, a true partner to us, helping us to do for you what we. I mean, help let it let it be both ways, uh, a two way street, which a partnership is. Um, what we tend to look for or some of the programs that I'm thinking about that I talk to my customers with or some of my clients like University of Houston, 
Um, we're talking about helping them to build classrooms of the future and how can we help them incorporate some different things that would be helpful for us as a company into their classrooms, not just, um, <clears throat> not just with how, they, uh, how the students learn, but also what the students are learning. Um, I think they already are offering um, AWS, certification, AWS certifications and classes within their curriculum. We're talking to them about uh, also adding uh, Microsoft credentials into their classroom. So what we want to do is help them to um, help the students be college and career ready. And so truly partnering with us to, to provide uh, what we need so that when they, when they um, enter the workforce or enter internships, that they are ready to do what we need for them to do. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. Okay. Thank you. So I want to move on and um, talk about data. So I'm a, a data nerd at heart. I'm passionate about data. Um, and so in Texas, we're privileged enough that we have, I would call it a tsunami of data. Like it's just this wave of information, both from the K-12 to post to workforce. Um, and honing in on sort of the, the UI wage records, the, the job posting data, the labor market data, from a two-year and four-year perspective, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities do you face with using those type of data? Um, I'll start and I'll, I'll be quick on the technical pieces and happy to follow up with anyone um, later and even get you the folks on our side that work and live in this area day to day. Um, our data systems are inadequate is the short answer. We're fortunate to have them. The Austin Community College is one of the few colleges, at least in our state, that has had access to UI, unemployment insurance, wage records. It's phenomenal to be able to align and match. How are our students doing when they leave our college? What are their wages? Where do we need to make improvements and adjustments? Um, which is why we feel better prepared than maybe some of our peers for this conversation. Um, but that data doesn't tell us how many hours somebody worked. So I don't know who's working full-time, who's working three or four part-time jobs, who worked a little bit and reached the threshold, who's working 150% of what they should be to reach that threshold. We don't have that information. We often don't have good geographic information. We don't know often where they're working. We don't have good confidence in the occupations they're working in. So we may have trained somebody and educated somebody to thrive in advanced manufacturing, but they're now working in healthcare and we don't know the difference. Or they've got a great IT skill set and they can be working in any industry field. Right? So there's a lot of information and alignment that we need to refine and get better at and there's ways to kind of get there. Um, so I'll start there. But the other piece I want to highlight is we're not familiar with using these data. And any powerful, strong set of data is always a double-edged sword and it can do more harm than good. Um, and so as we start to use this and, and communicate, it'd be really easy for me as, an, as on an administrative team to bring information back to our faculty whose life is given and dedicated to students and inadvertently telling them that they are not good at their job. That would be the message that our faculty would hear, regardless of which program, what that data says. And so there needs to be a very thought out process about what can and can't any set of data tell us how do we prioritize what that is? How do we understand what that is? And then start to operationalize based on that. At the same time, though, we are moving in the state of Texas to funding our, our, our ability to get state appropriations on our ability to deliver credentials. We're going to move towards credentials of value. This is coming our way. So we can't take another two decades being cautious and socializing and thinking about this, because at the end of the day, we are paid to provide value to our students. So it's our job to balance this and use this information well and figure out how to get there as fast as we can. You know, my, my mother was a uh, school teacher, school counselor, and one day she came and she said she had a student, I think Johnny, who um, gave this incredible answer to this question she had asked in class. And the answer that he gave, as elaborate and sophisticated as it was, was the wrong answer to the question. And she says, you know what, Johnny? That's a good answer to another question. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that to say we are very data rich in the state of Texas. Really, nationally, we have a lot of data sources that other countries don't have. And it's not a lack of data. It's not understanding the story data is trying to tell us and being data rich and execution poor. 
And when we don't know how, if we can't understand the story or we misinterpret the story data is trying to tell us, then we're creating a solution for a problem that does not exist. And so part of understanding data is being able to to adequately and accurately interpret the story the data is trying to tell us. And if we can understand that story, then we begin to question what factors contribute to this? What factors can we remove that are creating barriers to get into the outcomes that we want? I think part of our challenge is some of us do clearly understand the story data is trying to tell us, um, but it's not comfortable for us. And so there's a lack of action or, um, or how we execute to improve outcomes. Um, it's done in a way that um, makes it easy and comfortable for us to have those conversations. And I'll say this, because we do have access to so much data, um, shame on us if we don't do something effective and impactful with it. We already know what the needs are, and they've been some of the same needs for decades. So the question is, what can we do differently? What can we do courageously to address the story the data is trying to tell us and create a different ending from what we are experiencing presently? How are we going to work to solve, to use data, I would say in a predictive way so that we don't have the challenges in the future that we're experiencing in the present? Um, so I, I, I like to use this term like a predictive analytical approach to data. And so it's not that we don't have data. I think we have to improve how we execute and we can't be afraid because it's not giving us a story we want, we take that and we create the story that we need. Wow. I wanna go a little bit deeper into what you're just saying, right? I think data can provide transparency, right? And I think we have to choose to be transparent with families and students. I, I think we're really in this crossroads, crossroads um, across the nation when it comes to higher education workforce. We know that based off the estimates that 62% of all jobs in Texas are going to require some type of um, credential beyond high school. Um, there's conversations that we're having with the Texas Workforce Commission and, and we believe that that's an underestimated number. So right now we're thinking it's around 90 to 92% of all jobs by 2030 will require some type of credential value beyond high school. Um, but at the same time, what you were just mentioning, Kimberly, we know that value is not value is not value. And we've known that for decades. So how do we ensure that we're allowing students, this is a tough question and I'm going off script, so bear with me. Um, you know, how do we ensure that we can create a space for students to follow their passion and strive to become what they want to become, but also have economic prosperity or just even a living wage. I really think it we're this that we're in an age right now where in the eighties, nineties, even in the early two thousands, we created educational opportunities to create social mobility. But I think currently I think we have to we I think students have to receive a credential just to have a living wage. So from a employer perspective, from a two year, from a four year, how do we make sure that we are cutting through all the noise that we're hearing so that parents and students, lifelong learners have the information they need to know here are the skills that you need and here are some strategies to help you get a, a living wage once you've finished that credential. So it's, it's funny you say that. It brings to mind a, um a story I just heard this week actually on NPR, and I don't even remember who's talking, so I apologize for not giving them credence, but um, I'll give them the credit. Um, they talked about following your dreams, which is we've always said, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. Um, and there was a story about a young man who could play baseball very well, um, and he, but he was really good at school. He wasn't going, his, his a recruiter recognized or gave him a, a, um, 
a contract to go to the minor leagues, but he recognized that he may not ever make it to the major leagues. And but he was really good. He was a really good student. He was really good in school. And they told him at the end of the day, the advice to him was follow your dreams, but follow, follow your dreams, but but follow the dream that you have the skill set and the talent to achieve. So in following this in in helping our students to follow those dreams. I'm gonna to try to tie this together. In helping our students follow those dreams, we want to make sure that we provide them with different opportunities of very various opportunities. So not just traditional um, traditional settings in school. Um, obviously nowadays uh, we have a lot of different MOOC style learning um, or like different different types of credentials that students can get and use and use to go forward with things. Um, you have your, your two-year institutions that, that do a better job of being more flexible, and uh, we mentioned agility, being more flexible and agile, so thank you to the two-year institutions that are helping uh, schools like that. I want you to talk about that Tesla um, example. Um, and that the four-year institutions are providing foundations for students to be able to be flexible and learn. So they provide a different style of learning that help students know where, how to navigate and how to learn, but where the two-year institutions provide um, the quick um, accessible learning or, or the, those things that can be ready to use right away. So we have to figure out how to fuse both of those. Fuse the ready to learn or ready, um, what is it, almost like a meal ready to eat, the MREs. If anybody's ever been through a hurricane, you know what that is. Um, um, the MREs, we have to be, we have to be, have some ready to use um, education or, or digestible size learning that can be used right away, but also help um, have the four institute, four year institutions and other institutions help the students know how to learn and how to use that information so that when they get to the workforce, they're able to take all that information, quickly pivot on the dime to do whatever it is that they learn how to do. Companies like Microsoft value growth and learning constantly. I told my colleagues that I didn't get my first, I came to Microsoft with the PhD. I didn't get my first promotion until I got a, a certification. And that took me a while because I thought I was done. But until I learned that I have to continue growing and learning and I have to get those certifications, I have to get those credentials to, to show that I still can learn. Um, you know, I wasn't able to move forward, so I hope that helps. I'll say that <clears throat> um, because I do know the data um, and I know better that I have to do better, whether my students know the reality of the statist statistical outlook for them entering, completing, and entering the workforce. And our students, sometimes, you know, when we, we talk about student success and how to usher them and create a cultural environment um, where they do experience success, sometimes we just have to have real talk. And um, they're, you know, I tell them, look, you're 18, you're gonna make mistakes. It's, you're not gonna, you don't know how to figure all of this out. It's part of it for, first gen and underserved populations is they need, they don't really understand financial literacy. They don't understand how financial aid works. They don't know how to use it. Um, and then when they enter these, I mean, everyone in here is an adult. So you, you've, everyone has had a storm in life at some point. And our students don't understand when they enter these storms that they think it's the end of the world. They don't, many of them come not believing that they even deserve to be there. And they don't, they haven't lived enough life to know there's another side to this storm. It's gonna pass, it's not gonna be here forever. And what do you need to do in the storm to prepare for your success when you went on the other side? And so a lot of it, students will thrive when they see other students like them experiencing success. Students won't quit, they won't give up when workforce reaches in and provides these mentors, provides the, the relationship. How do we survive? How do we thrive? Um, so in my, from the world according to Kimberly, it's, it's having real talk, real discussion. I know it's hard, but it's gonna be harder if you stop. Mm -hmm. 
and I know that you want to quit and you want to give up and you want to try and take an easier route, but you have a $5,000 balance. And if you want to go to another campus, how are you going to get a transcript? I know that it's hard, but it's going to be harder if you quit. And I'll close with this one story because I have three boys that are emerging adults and I'm trying to have this, maybe they need to hear it from somebody else other than me, but I'm trying to have this conversation with them as well. And when I was teaching first grade, they sent us these caterpillars and we had to watch them metamorphosize into butterflies. And the teacher's edition said, when the caterpillar is trying to break through, the children will see this struggle. They're gonna wanna cut the chrysalis or peel it open to help the butterfly get out. And when that happens, they say when the butterfly is struggling to get out, blood is pumping through the veins of the wings. If you disrupt that process, blood can't pump through the wings. And so when the wings dry, if we disrupt that process, the butterfly will be paralyzed for life. And I'm saying that to say, if we don't disrupt that struggle and we coach them through, when the blood pumps through the wings and the, the wings dry, the butterfly can fly. We can love our children to paralysis. And I'm not saying that we don't create this, this environment um, where they can, we help usher the success, but they have, the struggle creates their strength. And we have to be able to create an, the opportunity. I know it's hard, but don't stop. I can't get you out of this, but I can think with you and help you problem solve and get to the other side. But there is another side outside of this chrysalis. And if you want to be able to fly, you've got to pump this lesson you're learning through your wings. Does this make sense to you guys? But the university, um, and, I, and I won't speak for Gary, but I'm assuming also for the community college, we can't do it by ourselves. If we don't have partnership and we are not a functioning member of the community, we're not going to have the success that we need for that butterfly to take flight. And so it really becomes, I know it's overused, but it really does become that village mentality. How do we create the networks, the relationships, the, from public school to community college to university to workforce to ensure that our students not only are prepared when they graduate, but they don't quit before they get to that end in mind. You should drop the bike. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's powerful. I'm, I'm stuck thinking about, there are a lot of structural inequalities that make it harder than it should be. So what is the balance, right? How many butterflies can't get out because it's harder than it needs to be? Yes. And there's a balance there that we need to figure out. And there's a bunch of stories I won't get to now, but one, um, one I'm thinking about is in our, in our, with our healthcare partners. Sometimes the road to realizing your dreams is longer because of things that are not fair. Systemically and systematically, we are trying to figure out how does academics and academia align with a labor market that has structural inequality. So do our institutions. This is a big conversation. What I want to focus on is several of the individuals that come to any of our colleges across the country, why do a disproportionate number of them who have lower income or who don't have white skin in a healthcare sense have a longer road to becoming a nurse? Many start out in lower paying certified nurse assistant, patient care techs, they then go to the licensed vocational nursing program and then to an RN program. Whereas others are able to go straight to an RN program and into a higher paying job, maybe years before some of their fellow students. And when you look at some of this, it's because of a lot of variables we don't often think enough about. How do we break down some of these so that the road is similar as much as we can for students regardless of how we identify? And that's something we have not always done enough about. But a lot of that is not solely in the academic space. Some of that is in the workforce space. Some of our partners need to think more about when you're going to an RN registered nurse program, a lot of our students are encouraged not to work because it is so rigorous. It is hard. It demands a lot of you. But a lot of our students don't have that option. You need to work. So how are you supposed to get through a program in the same amount of time? And there's a limit to how much we have for financial aid and dollars to make that path equitable. That's an honest conversation without easy answers. But if all we're focused on is access, who's getting access to which programs is now an unequitable solving for the wrong problem. 
credentials of value try to help us think about closer to the ends in mind and how do we solve for that. Um, but I don't want to be all doom and gloom. A lot has been happening on this. The other story I'll share real quick that Charisma you brought up. Um, every opportunity we can take to realize a better road is important. And we have a, part, a set of partners, Samsung and Tesla, happen to be in Austin and they're doing a lot to engage with us to create good pathways. Um, one of the stories that we get to share is that we are breaking down the barriers between a four-year traditional education and what a two-year education is to try to put these together. One of those is our partners at the University of Texas at Austin have a bioscience program that didn't have the lab and technical pieces that students need coming out of a four-year program to land jobs in that industry. Several of those students now come to Austin Community College to get direct lab training and apply training with industry at the tail end of that four-year degree. We've taken the best of these programs and put them together. Samsung and Tesla are asking us to do something very similar for four-year engineering grads. One of our most hallowed, can I get into engineering? They're incredibly competitive. We've got great co-enrolled programs. Our companies are telling us when they come to us, they don't have the skill sets to be immediately helpful in the company. And so we're reducing wages. We're creating longer time to promotion. We're actually forced, we think, to make choices as companies that diminish the value for us and for these employees. And so we're now building programs and looking at what this would be for an, a new employee hired at, in this case, Tesla, for their job to be go to ACC for 7, 12, 14 weeks, we will pay you to get this training at the community college, get that credential, and then come back to work with us. We're doing more and more of this alignment, and I think at root, that's something we need to think about with credentials of value. We cannot build this on one side or the other. Too many companies don't have the academic data, right, that we just, that Kimberly laid out that we have. They don't know how, who's coming out, what skill sets do they have, how do we align, and how do we do that well. So Garrett, you, you, you bring up an excellent example of sort of a fluid and dynamic, a bi-directional relationship that's happening with the two-year and an employer. I'm, I, I think that's, from my perspective, that's the exception, not the rule. So from all your perspectives, this will be the last question, then we'll open it up to see if any of the audience have any question. But from your perspective, how can we what are some best strategies to create sort of this dynamic feedback back loop that we must have to make sure that we're creating a talented um, and educated workforce for the needs of employers? So I, I think it goes back to cre that opening those lines of communication. Like um, I know some of the universities have advisory boards, um, but Microsoft has advi advisory boards for educational institutions to participate in and tell us what you need in your institutions, but in the same way, have the institutions have advisory boards for different companies. When I was in graduate school, um, we had advisory boards of the different companies to come to the school and tell them, tell, uh, tell the, the school what they need. So when we come together to the same table, and have regular communications and honest and transparent communications about bi-directional needs, I think it works a lot better for both uh, or all parties involved just to understand uh, what what you need and how can we meet that need and what I need first and how I can meet that, I can meet your needs as well. So, quick answer. My word for that, because that's exactly right. Uh, we talk a lot about mutually reinforcing self-interest. Too often we're trying to build this alignment out of goodwill. And that'll start, it'll go a little ways, but all of those efforts in our experience have not gotten to where we need to be. Philanthropic investment, we've done a lot of great alignment. A lot of advisory boards are there to look at curriculum, but they think about it not with their own scope in mind. In fact, there's a lot of advisory boards across the country that exist where several of the individuals from industry haven't hired someone in the last five years, eight years, 10 years. Well, that's not as helpful advice in that case. The best and strongest partnerships we have are where we are focusing on where our industry partners have a real and critical need that we can answer because our students are that answer. We're focusing our time there and a lot of our strongest partnerships with Samsung, Tesla, Toyota, Army Futures Command, Microsoft, Dell, have this at their core. And I'll give a real quick example with a company I won't name because it's not a flattering story yet. Um, we have one of our best engaged partners that if I named you would know, 
who has done more than maybe any other partner at this moment to create several direct education training programs to their employment. There's for freshmen in high school, for senior in high school, for seniors that have not found a college afterwards for a summer gap program, and just to hire outright. There's four roads into this company for high school students. Every one of those four roads, when we started talking about it, would pay the same wage. That's a problem. Why would I, as a freshman in high school, give up after-curricular activities, give up time for sports or whatever else, and give up a lot of time if my peer, who did nothing until senior year, could get the same wage? Why do all of this if I could just go in summer and get hired? All of those programs now unravel despite the best efforts to create a whole new kind of aligned effort where you're getting high school degrees, college degrees, and now tech aligned technical skill sets. The other problem is that every one of those pays for those high school students would have paid more than adults working in this company who just entered. Well, now you've created an entire cultural challenge internally. And this company, to the best of their interest, realize we need to stop and think about what, how does our entire hiring structure work? How do we now align with high schools and college and create a career pathway, not just an academic pathway, that creates the best of what we need for a company? And that has taken a lot of time. You'll hear soon, it's actually about a lot of the stuff we're doing, but inadvertently, we would have created a fundamental challenge or a problem there. Um, despite the best interest, despite all the wonderful stories we could tell, if we're not focused on the mutually aligned interests, we're not going to get the right answers. You know, when you talk about the feedback loop, um, it reminds me when I was trying to help my son with sixth grade math. Like, I have a PhD, right? You would think I could do sixth grade math. And I'm like, no, son, this is how you do it. You don't do it like this. He's like, mom, stop. Stop trying to make me think like you. I'm not you. And it was kind of, I hit like this, this wall of understanding and I'm like, well, you're right, son, show me how you see this. And I think when we talk about creating this feedback loop is being able to step out of our own understanding. And, you know, Garrett and I were talking last week and he's like, sometimes when I work with companies, I have to be a translator to help them think about what it is that they're trying to communicate and say, help me understand how you see this. Help me understand where you think this is going. Um, help me understand. And then with that understanding, be able to translate that into something that's practical that we can execute at a, a community college or a university level. And then at the university level, we have to be able to work with our faculty, our staff, our programs and say, okay, help me understand how you see this working. And it's almost like we're, we're trying to create this bilingual language, because um, it's two different languages. And, and if we don't have a way to kind of translate actual needs, um, again, we're gonna create solutions for problems that don't exist. So this feedback loop is not just a two-way communication going back and forth. I believe it is genuinely and authentically seeking to understand what challenges we have now and what challenges are we gonna have in the future that we can address in the present. Almost planning, a uh, Dr. Gibson shared this yesterday. What are we doing now that's going to prepare us for 20 years down the road? Um, so that feedback loop, it has to be ongoing. Um, you all know this. It has to be ongoing. It has to be continuous. You know, that's normal. But how do we step out of our own world of understanding? Because sometimes the what we need to do is bigger than the understanding that we're bringing to the table. And we have to have enough humility to know, I don't, I don't know the answer, but let's, let's, let's talk through it. Let's figure this out together, where it is truly a partnership that is symbiotic. Thank you. So, um, so I think, thank you for all those responses. And I think the underlying sort of thing that comes to my mind with creating this ongoing feedback loop is making sure that we're establishing trust yes. among each other. Trust with students and parents, trust with two years and four years, trust with um, you know elected officials, trust with employers, um, and making sure that we have those clear outcomes 
so that we can so that we can cut through all the noise that we experience every day through emails, postings, social media, so that people have the right information at the right time to make the right decisions. So I want to open up the floor to see if anybody has any questions. I, I can't see. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your time and, and the visions that y'all have shared with us today. I, I'm a trustee at Dallas College. Uh, we're very fortunate to have about 120,000 students that we have the privilege of doing this. I'm also very honored to work with Dr. Lanan, who his motto is we're in the barrier busting business. That's really why we're here. I have a little bit different, uh, I've come out of the business world of 50 years, so I look at it from the employer side that one of the things that I think we as uh, colleges, especially community colleges, have failed to do is to really appreciate our value. I don't think we've sold our worthiness to the industry, and so, but one of the things that I'd like for you, when you look at the word credentials of value, I, I, I think we need to have a different program that helps the employer see the value of a credential. In other words, sometimes it, to have appreciation of value, you have to make an investment. So in the nursing industry, in an area in which we're moving greatly into in a, in a way, because I come out of a chairman of the board of Parkland Hospital, where one day I was 250 nurses short. So I understand the need for that. But to get an instructor to come and work at Dallas College in our nursing program, she can make more on a two-day weekend at a hospital. So my theory for you is to think and comment on, if y'all who are paying as employers bonuses to get employees, why not invest that with us, pay the bonus up front to us, as an incentive to create a credential of value to come back to you. So I'm, I'm looking at it for your comments on how we get our employers to invest in the institutions to in turn give you back a credential of value. Yeah, I, if the credential does not have value of workforce, why are we doing it? I think that's number one. But you posed a really good, uh, I guess, paradigm shift of understanding. Um, this is a value. And, you know, I had a chance to meet with Parkland because we also have a nursing program. He said, we have more jobs. We could hire all of your graduates and still have 50,000 openings. And it's really just having the conversation, well, what are we going to do different? And if we want to do something different, are you willing to invest skin in the game? And so I think those conversations should be had, um, not only with healthcare, but with all of the industries that we serve. But I, I do want to say with complete, I don't know, a strong word, but if the credential does not have value in the workforce, then why are we doing it? Everything that we should do should be able to help students get into the workforce pretty much in stay. So I, I, I appreciate your comment because we do need to have those conversations. And, I, and I'll stress what I said before, we cannot do it alone. It has to be a community um, that, that we do it together. Okay, so I think I, um, if I understand your question or if I understand your comment and question, you ju you're just saying, why don't employers invest in the learning and credentials of the the students to come, to come get them to work in our workforce? Am I, am I paraphrasing that correctly? And actually we are. Like a lot of companies are already doing that. Um, I think uh, Garrett's example at Tesla, they're doing that. I know Microsoft, are, we actually are doing, we have programs to, to fill that large gap of, of software engineers and those types of things. We have different programs d working with different institutions to um, upskill a, a brand new set of people to bring them straight into Microsoft or some uh, Microsoft or Microsoft partners uh, to uh, work in the, to fill those roles that we need, those skill sets that we need immediately. So that is happening um, actually, you just, 
let's let's talk. Let's I'll talk about it. I'll say quickly, and we'll probably get to more questions if we don't all answer everyone's questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll do this quickly. Um, I think you're foreshadowing the future. That is where we're headed. We are coming from a world where the question was, do you have this level of degree? Most employers didn't care too much which institution, where it was from, sometimes not even what it was in, depending on what it was. We're going to a world where that's going to matter a lot more. Several companies, Dallas, you have one of the biggest college foundations in the state. Right? Lots of people are giving, lots of companies are investing, but we haven't thought as much about for what credential, and that's what the credential value conversation is all about. So I, I hope that's where we're headed. Hi, um, I love all of the uh, thinking that you are all doing about the challenges for uh, low-income students, uh, later in life students, and for uh, students who are people of color. I'd love to hear what you're thinking about how credentials of value can contribute towards building greater pathways towards education and employment uh, for, for people with disabilities. What are some of the challenges you're seeing there uh, and what are perhaps some of the solutions uh, that, that you're mulling and that you're thinking over? I'll answer that pretty quickly. Um, just like the program that the other gentleman spoke about, um, many of our companies, I know Microsoft, in gen Microsoft specifically is especially invested in accessibility and accessibility programs and those types of things. So we have a, a completely separate um, or a completely uh, sp specialized program for hiring folks with um, accessibility needs. So um, that is built in, it's, it's already built in all of our products. And in order to build those products, we need f people that it impacts to give that input so we directly hire from that community and there's a special process to recruit and hire for those um, those types of uh, jobs does that help okay Thank you so much, this has been great. Uh, I'm at a university in Minnesota, University of St. Thomas, and I run an initiative called Business in a Digital World, and our goal is what you're talking about. We go out and talk to employers and say, what are the skills our business students need to have to be successful in today's changing business world? Um, where we struggle and where I'd like you to go deeper is what specifically do you mean by a credential of value? I can see that as you take the associate's degree, the, the bachelor's, the master's, and put more real world skills into it. I can see giving badges along the way. I can see giving certificates along the way. And then do, are, do those, if it's something smaller like a certificate, is it a certificate we create? We created one called Business in a Digital World for our undergrads, or is it a, hey, you've got AWS certification or you've got a Salesforce certification. So can you get more concrete on what you mean by a credential of value? Absolutely. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> All, of All of the above. So I, I'll give you a, a very specific example. Uh, prior to going to the courting board, I was at the University of Texas system, and we were using the data to determine um, whether or not students were in the red after graduating, right? And so we saw some of the most popular majors, psychology and sociology, being two majors where the, the, there, was no, uh, there was a limited ROI or return on investment for that degrees. So UT uh, worked with uh, Google and established uh, a data science grow with Google certificate that's embedded into the psychology and sociology program. So as they're pursuing, they're following their passion, they're also getting uh, a skill that's gonna be highly desired in the industry so we can help boost that earnings potential. Um, and, and drilling a little bit deeper into credentials of value, what I'm excited about with our strategic plan is that we have to be transparent with the earnings outcomes. So we're encouraging uh, women and women of color to pursue computer science. And just stick it out, you can do it, you're gonna do great. Once they go into the workforce, we know from the data, the first year out, when you follow students who get the same degree from the same year from the same institution, Women of color are making seven to ten thousand dollars less than white and Asian men in the same industry, with the same degree. And so, with that, we have to do a better job of figuring out how we can create agency and skills for students to 
negotiate salaries once they're going into the workforce, but then also having better relationships with employers to say, if you need a talented workforce, you need to pay them the same. I'll add real quick that this is a conversation at a very high level, so it can be as applicably as broadly as possible. For a college on the ground, when we get down to the very more minute focus, it sounds a lot like the work you're also doing. Um, what it looks like to me, a credential of value means there are companies who will either preferential hire because someone has that credential, or we will pay more because of that credential. Now, how you scale that becomes the very, very tricky problem, right? Because scale at companies need different things. So how we message and communicate that at its highest and initial level looks exactly like what the state of Texas is asking of us, right? Which credentials am I likely to make more than what I invested to get in the first place? But at a deeper level, we're really after for the workforce applicable parts of this. Will, am I more likely to get a job because I did this or should I just have gotten the job anyway? And that's a real question for some of our credentials, right? And will I get paid more? Okay, so I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for attending our session this morning and have a great day.